Welcome to the Mighty Oak Show. Glad to have you with us again today, and this is a special episode for us. Today, the Mighty Oaks Foundation, Mighty Oaks Warrior Programs, is uh, in the middle of hosting our first responder program. So for those of you that watch regularly, you know that Mighty Oaks, we serve the veteran community, active duty, military community, and spouses, and additionally, the first responder community. And this is one of those weeks where we have a group of first responders here, and we're dealing with Many of the same issues that we deal with as we speak to veterans and active duty service members, issues related to trauma, just the difficulties of life and work, but there are some unique challenges. And we also know that in the day we're living in right now, at this exact moment in time, there are some real unique challenges for our first responder community. And wanted to do this show, we're on location, this is where it's happening. In fact, classes just let out a minute ago. Our students are out at lunch and uh, they're doing what they're doing pulled in uh, some of our team leaders. And, and again, one of the, the wonderful things about what we do, and I'm a little bit biased, I know that, but one of the wonderful things about what we do and how we do it is that all of our classes are led by men and women, as the case may be, who have been there and done that. In our veterans programs, with our active duty service members, those who are teaching classes and leading the breakouts and doing the work with our students are those who have served in the military, who have been in combat, who know what they're talking about. And in our first responder community, it's the same, uh, same thing. Our first responder instructors and team leaders are folks who have been first responders, who have done the work. Some of them are still doing the work. And so they're speaking from a position of personal experience. And man, that's a huge asset when you're trying to help folks who are typically guarded, who are typically not interested in, in sharing what they're going through. Uh, when we're trying to help people like that, we need to come at that from a position of personal experience and testimony. And that's what we've done, so uh, guys, appreciate you taking some time um, to do this. What an important conversation right now. Uh, take some time, real quick, we'll start at the end. Introduce yourself, uh, what you do, what you're doing here with Mighty Oaks. My name is Saul Villanova. I am the Charlie team leader. I served in the Marine Corps from 1999 to 2004. I then uh, served with the Monterey County Sheriff's Office from 2007 and till 2019 when I was medically retired. Yeah. I'm currently uh, not working due to uh, some traumatic spine injury Yeah. and just working here at Mighty Oaks. Yeah. You're not working except here 24 hours a day. 24 <laughs> hours a day, <laughs> so good. real work. Yeah, it's God's kind of work, but it's God's work. There God's you go. work. Justin. Uh, Justin Howe, I uh, was in the Marine Corps for from 2007 to 2012. After that, I transitioned out and became law enforcement in Virginia, in Stafford County, right outside of Quantico, and then transitioned my last four years, a quote of total of seven, um, in Manassas Park uh, Police Department, so a little bit city-ish uh, near the Northern Virginia area. Um, I got out last year in April, transitioned out of that, and became an instructor for law enforcement for the Department of State, so I do that now. I've um, been doing that for about a year and some change now, so it's been good. Awesome. Colin Field, I did uh, 14 years in the Navy, uh, serving as a SEAL and a medic. I uh, got out um, from there and uh, started working for the county, uh, EMS, worked on an ambulance for two years, and then uh, worked for Life Light as a paramedic for four years. Yeah. I'm Dustin Shellhammer. I spent 21 years as a firefighter, paramedic, and a police officer. Um, did time with the feds and spent time traveling to major disasters across the country. I'm currently a uh, health, safety, and environmental manager for Admiral Permian Resources, an old field company out in West Texas, and they are gracious enough to give me time off to be here. Yeah, that's cool. We appreciate them doing that too. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, I'd like to just have a conversation, and so, you know, this isn't answer the question and we'll move on necessarily, unless you just have a real quick thought, but let's, uh, let's have a discussion around some of these things. Again, I, I think this is a, a, such an important time for the first responder community to have some context in what they're doing, but then on a larger sense for the community, for the culture, for our country to understand the work of the first responders and some of the unique challenges that they're dealing with. And, uh, we were just talking about this briefly, but this is this is police and fire. This is the paramedics who are out on the street. We see so much of what's happening right now, and, and a lot of the attention is focused on the police officers who are out there. Sometimes the National Guard is out there. But you have EMS, paramedics, firefighters. When cities are burning down, people are being injured, uh, those folks are going into a war zone and, and really making things happen. 
So I'd like to talk about some of these things. I have some questions written down, but I'll just throw them out there and whoever wants to start can. Um, let's just start with this one. This is a big kind of high level question. What are some of the unique challenges in the first responder community? Something that's unique. We talk about veterans a lot, particularly on this show. Um, and for those who are plugged into Mighty Oaks, we talk about veterans a lot, active duty service members a lot. So many similarities. In fact, you know, Dusty was our first uh, official first responder firefighter who came into our veterans program and we were really trying to figure out if that would work and it did and it's worked well over the years. But there are some unique aspects to, to this work, to what you guys have done and uh, to what you know, many of our students are doing. Talk to that for a second. Don't want to jump on that. Some of the unique aspects of that. I think the, uh, one of the biggest unique aspects is trying to please everybody. Um, it's such a divided country right now. Um, either perceived or real and whenever they go into a situation even the law enforcement and paramedics and firefighters themselves are divided in their own firehouses as to how they believe and what they should do but to serve the community is their primary goal and so they're having to deal with situations at the moment they don't have any backstory they don't have any way to check a background check they have to deal with the situation that they're given directly right now and then the whole world gets to sit back and judge them on the decision they made. Right. And I think that that's very complicated because, you know, we all hear the phrase Monday morning quarterback. And it's simple for us to look at a video when somebody only shows half of a cell phone video of what happened. And sure, it looks awful. But when the whole story comes out six weeks later, it was a little bit different story. And then you can kind of side with the first responder as to why he handled that situation right. the way he did. But the world is blown up before yeah, he's and, had an opportunity to get But that. nobody takes the time to go back and say, hey, you know what? We were wrong. We didn't have the whole right. story. They right. just leave it on that negative burning fuse. And I think it's unfair to the first responders and nobody takes into consideration that they have a split second to act. They have to make a decision and they're human. Right. They're doing the best they can with what they're given at that moment. Yeah. And then they have to pay a lifelong consequence for that decision, and nobody gives them any grace in that yeah. decision. Yeah. To piggyback on that, too, you know, a lot of these guys are going to situations and they're dealing with that trauma, right? This might be that person's worst day of their life, but that's what we do every day. We respond to these calls, and it's the worst day of somebody's life. But that's our life but that's daily. every day for you. Our yeah. life daily, which means we don't have time to heal, right? And I think that's what's so significant about the stories and the testimonies that not only the instructors give throughout each one of these classes, but what these guys are telling us when they come here is how much they've been suffering this whole time and hiding it. You know, we talk about first responders being the master of masks because that's what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they go from one call and it might be the most gruesome scene they've ever seen and then have to go talk to somebody and be gentle and nice sure. and pretend that that call was the first call they went to because sure. there's a certain level of professionalism, yeah. a certain level of customer service, and that whole time they're just stuffing these traumatic incidents down and then they can't figure out why a law enforcement or first responder went sideways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, he's got a lifetime of trauma and nobody's helped him heal. Right. Right. So I think that's what's so powerful about this program. Um, Colin, you have both combat experience, and I know, you know several of you guys do, but combat experience, the military side, special operations community, mm -hmm. and then serving as a paramedic and EMS and dealing with that. Um, can you contrast those two a little bit and, and the uniqueness of the first responder community and, and the, the veteran community is amazing and you know mm -hmm. we serve the veteran community we talk about that all the time but it's not exactly the same and mm -hmm. Dusty's helped me a lot with this but can you can contrast the two a little bit absolutely yeah so <clears throat> um, I think that from a combat side you are exposed to a lot in a short amount of time um, and to kind of relate it to medical terms it would be like getting a bolus shot right so if, for instance, if we have somebody who uh, we need to medicate with pain medication, we can give them, you know, a shot of, of morphine or something like that, right? Versus like first responders who maybe not as much 
in one shot, but it's a slow drip over time. So it's like hanging an IV bag that's constantly um, going into them. And over time, that keeps adding up and stacking up into the system. So um, it's definitely different, um, but similar. Yeah. Yeah, the slow drip analogies. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so a lot of unique challenges, and I'm sure you guys could all talk longer on that. Uh, why is it so hard then for those in the first responder community to get help? It's not that help isn't available, because we know it is. There are programs like the Mighty Oaks Foundation, but there are many other programs as well. Um, you know, Justin, maybe let's start this conversation. Why is it so hard for those in that community? Because you told your story this morning, I heard it this morning, again, yeah. I was reminded of it again. Why is it hard to get help, even when help is, ne ne is available and you know it's needed? It's difficult. I mean, I, uh, we, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago when I actually actually got to put Stafford County Sheriff Department. Um, we actually did a law enforcement thing there. It was a program there. It was probably about six, seven guys there. Uh, and it was awesome because they got to come out and just see what Mighty Oaks can do for them. But the major thing is the concept is law enforcement is completely different than the military. Because military, yes, for help, you're getting support financially, you're getting all that. Um, and because it's well known, everybody wants to help a veteran, you struggle, you serve our country, also, well, here's some benefits that actually support you financially, and here's, they're going to send you medical and get you some VA help, but law enforcement, you go out and you say you have issues from traumatic things you've been through, and they're, give me your badge, you give me your gun, and that's your end of your career, and people have families, and knowing that, that's just pretty much saying, yep, I'm done, and they're not getting pensions, they're just they got to find work after that, and then they sit down and spiral from there because there's nothing they can do. Right. I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of the guys. And also, it's one of those things when you go up to your command. Um, I mean, I've been blessed to work at two commands that support Mighty Oaks, but I just know law enforcement around the world, people, my friends I've talked to, uh, they do that. It's kind of like, man, yeah, that's what you signed up to do, man. Yeah, in, right. In reality, they're suffering too. Right. Um, or they have jobs that don't have them go out all the time. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, Dustin and I, Last year did a, a conference for uh, military and first responders and we did a Q&A and that was one of the things that came up is I've been doing this job for a long time, how do I get help? I think that's not only for law enforcement, I think that's also for those in you know, the fire community and the EMS community. To piggyback on that, in the fire community, you build up this image to your brothers that you are strong enough to protect them mm -hmm. and then they have to be strong enough to protect you. Mm -hmm. There's a saying in, in the fire service. I'm sure that it's in other team aspects as well, but in the fire service, it's, it's a saying that um, I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing it for you. So I have to be strong so I can make sure Justin goes home at night. Yeah. Justin has to be strong to make sure I can go home at night. I'm going to rely on Colin to make sure he's comfortable to protect me. And I think if you show that weakness, as they call it, if you let your brother firefighters know, hey, I'm not doing so well, I'm not mentally okay right now they're not going to trust you in your job and I'm, i think it's you don't want to show that weakness so you just bury all that because you don't want them to think that you're not capable of protecting them do you think that's changing at all no not exactly. not even if there should be standard issue i think taking care of first responders should be a standard issue thing and it should be you know maybe after critical incidents or Maybe after a certain amount of time, yeah. hey, you've done ten years. We need, we need to do a little, a yeah. little soul checkup. But I don't think we have it, even uh, on the top, from the top down. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overtures mm -hmm. yeah. made to that, but you don't think it's getting better. Yeah, so we've had uh, in both both jobs, our both um, departments, we had a guy coming every year, and you had to go through it, and he just pretty much tell you, hey, this is what life's going to be like. You need to find some things to do to keep you, you know stable because you're going to go through a lot of motions but at the same time it's just like you're going to a normal it's like a guy that just went to school for it and that was it and it's no really concrete like hard pressing to the core of your heart what you're experiencing it's just okay yeah just read more you know go run go do this you right. know talk to your spouse about how work is you know but that's about all as it goes so it doesn't really help that but coming here, I think the guys notice is that you're hearing somebody that's been there, done that, being emotional, grown men crying, and to them it's it's a difference. Okay, now that makes sense. Right. You know, because departments spend tens and thousands of dollars on a guy to come in for six hours. 
and expect it to work, but it, I, it doesn't. So for everyone that just decided not to come to our program, because Justin said you have to cry. <laughs> you have to cry. Some people just do. It's oh. incidental. Good point. You don't have to. <laughs> um, what do you say to this someone that, who needs to get help? And, you know, these are guys you've worked with. Someone that needs to get help, but is hesitant because of weakness, because of, you know, the things that you just talked about. How do you get someone to come to a program like this? How do you motivate them um <clears throat> yeah i would say I, I was kind of in that same boat it took me a while before i was willing to recognize first that there was a problem and two that i needed help with that yeah. problem and i think just letting more people be aware that i mean i from the background i came from i wasn't used to seeing guys seeking out help yeah. but uh once i got out and talking to some of the guys that i had served with I found out actually a lot of them were seeking that help and it's actually quite common that these problems we think that are individual to just us is actually a very wide problem that yeah. affects most of the population that we work with Absolutely. and so just making it more where more well known that everybody suffers from these same things that it's you're not a, a, in an individual issue yeah so along with that how important is testimony we we, we talk about testimony. Uh, to those that aren't maybe church people, it just means telling your story. Mm -hmm. um, how important is that as an aspect of you know, the healing process? And again, for instance, for those that don't know, we have classes. They're taught by men and women who have been there, who've experienced some of these things. But a big part of that is not just teaching the curriculum, it's telling your story, it's connecting your story to the curriculum. How important is that to the student that's sitting in the seat? I think it's hugely important. When I came through as a student, that was one of the, the things that got me to open up while I was here, is starting to listen to those stories. Because like I said, I thought that my problems were unique to just me. Yeah. And when I started hearing these instructors talk, I was like hearing <laughs> my story come out of their mouth. And it was shocking to me that I, I, I never knew that, that somebody else could feel the same things that I was feeling right. at that time. So seeing them open up and be vulnerable in front of me, it, it helped me to open up and, and start healing from that's good. I think my story is kind of unique because I was the first civilian to come to the program. I'm very patriotic and support the military 100%. When I went to the program and I sat down and it came time for me to tell my story, I'm looking out at all these military veterans and we've been trained to know that the military veterans are the guys with the problems. You know, they're the ones with the issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. When I finally... When I started telling my story and I look out there and see these men that I had so much respect for responding to my story mm -hmm. and seeing them share my pain, it helped me drastically to unload that pack as we talk about during, during the week and yeah. to see that, okay, all these people that I have such high respect for share the same problems that I have and now they're weeping for me. Right. And it, it helped right. a lot. Yeah. Right. Let's say the big thing for me that I think that I took up the the most is when I went through here and got done in 2015 and went back on the street as a cop. It was completely night and day for me. Um, did I see dramatic stuff again? Absolutely. But the difference was, is I found hope through here and I was able to pour out to the people that were actually dealing with it, the citizens. You know, and I think that the one, the best reward you can get is from somebody that just says, thank you, I have hope. Knowing in this situation, worse than a you know, situation ever. They lose a kid in an accident or a simple thing where a kid slips and hits his head and dies and you got to you have to counsel that parent and in that hour you're with them two out of three hours giving them hope from what you've understood it goes a long way to them and i think that absolutely helps you heal and see something and actually preach to yourself that there's hope in that and, and it also helps them and then you can leave there with a different perspective so i think that was the biggest thing for me just going back and just being a cop that actually understood things a little bit better and having peace uh, and just giving right. joy to other individuals during their traumatic scene. Uh, I, I think, and maybe it's, I hypothesize, that one of the reasons those in the first responder and military community don't get help is because they don't have hope. Because yeah. they just kind of go, well, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. Everyone I served with does the same stuff I do. In the veteran community, we talk about more than 20 a day mm -hmm. committing suicide, taking their lives. Um, in the first responder community, this, this never gets press. Uh, the numbers, we think, are probably even higher than they are in the veteran mm -hmm. community of mm -hmm. men and women taking their lives. 
Um, ironically, and it's again, it's counterintuitive almost. The fire service is is, is higher than in uh, the law enforcement community um, of men and women taking their lives. And you know, the veteran stuff we hear about all the time, we don't hear about that. But I think a lot of it just goes back to hopelessness. It's just, what's the point? Why am I going to do that? Everyone I know has medicated themselves out of this, or drunk themselves out of this, or whatever. Um, there is no hope. Uh, hope is huge. So since you started that conversation. Um, let's talk about hope. Where, uh, Saul, do you find hope? When someone needs hope, because that's a big word and it can be an anything, <laughs> right? Um, what do you say to someone who needs hope? Where did you find hope? I think I first found hope when I came here and I gave my testimony. And it was the first time in 20 years that I had talked about any of it to anybody. Um, especially with that level of transparency. And, you know, God is good, but he's also powerful. And he was powerful enough to take that hate that I felt and remove it from me. Now there was all kinds of stuff that was left that I had to work on. I'm not trying to say that everything was all peachy, but I've never felt hate again. Not like that. And so, you know, when I talk to people and it's time to give them hope, it's like, let me tell you what God can do because this is what he's done for me, yeah. right? And I think these guys are right when we talk about transparency. When we meet people and we need to give them hope, you know, we can't be wearing a mask. We need to tell them exactly where we were and how God has worked in our lives. And I think that considering some of the, the experiences that we've had I mean, common to all men, right? That's what we yeah. teach. And God has worked in us. And they, when they see joy, when they see me enjoying my kids and I post something on Facebook, you know, as maybe it's something simple, playing at the beach. Yeah. Considering that I never posted before, mm. especially anything good. Yeah. Right? And all of a sudden, I'm enjoying time with my family, with kids, with friends, you know, having barbecues. Yeah. God is good and God can change. So it's interesting about what you just said. I think a lot of people think that hope is an ethereal thing. It's, I'm going to put my confidence in what I believe might be out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But you just said that hope came because of transparency. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's not pretend. It's mm -hmm. not just gen up mm -hmm. some emotion mm -hmm. to get yourself to move forward. Mm -hmm. You found hope because people around you were being transparent and you had the opportunity to be transparent. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it reveals what's real, what's true, what's possible. Right. So that's hope. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. Justin, what do you tell people who need hope? Uh, first, to find the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and the truth is established in that relationship with Christ. And I think uh, that's the only way you're going to find hope. Uh, I've been looking for hope before Christ in all different areas, and it led me to destruction um, because I'm trying to fill a gap that only He can fill. And when I found Christ, that's where that's where it was, and it made me see it, the world in His lens, um, and that's kind of like how I found it. When I was tell somebody else they need help, but establish a good relationship with Christ, so that He can show you the truth and give you a lens that's completely different than your fleshly lens that you can't understand. Yeah, begin yeah. with the truth. Yeah, that's awesome. Call what you say. Yeah, similar to what Justin said. For me, hope was identified when I started that authentic relationship with Christ. Once I had that, that's when I first started seeing true hope and lasting change in my life and um, helping spread that message here with, uh, with fellow uh, veterans and first responders. This is my first year doing it, and I can actually see not just the hope in their eyes, I can see physical changes in these men mm -hmm. when they accept that hope. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, it's like witnessing miracles. Yeah, it's awesome. Dusty, what do you say to that? I try to tell people that um, what gave me hope is to witness that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Other people are hurting as much as I am, and that God heals all wounds. Yeah. And that um, with with a brotherhood of people around you that are feeling the same hurt that you are, and y'all can all turn to Christ, then there's the hope you need to accomplish anything. Yeah. You've got other men to lift you up, and yeah. you've got God to, to, to shed the light on you. That's awesome.
Man, it's transparency, it's truth, it's relationship with Christ, yeah. and just understanding the commonality of it, and linking arms with people. That's what we talk about is, is being connection, right? Um, man, that's great. Uh, this is a question I, I, I ask, I guess, because of the, the times that we're living through right now. But what would you, um, what, what would you want to say that you can't because you don't have the right platform, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say to the community at large that is, is really misunderstanding, in my opinion, misunderstanding the role of uh, first responders right now in our community? Every, every societal ill since 1776 is now being thrown at the feet of uh, the first responders in our country. What, what do you want the average man and woman in the community to know about you know, police officers, firefighters, those who are serving on the front lines of this thing? Anyone can jump on that and, and you'll have different ideas. I'd, I'd like to say that just about every person I've worked with in for, as a first responder, both in EMS, I've worked with firefighters, I've worked with the, uh, law enforcement as well on scenes, and almost every single person I've seen in that field got in that job to help people. Mm -hmm. That is their main goal in doing that job. And they truly do want to help their communities. And I think that um, they're getting a, a really bad rap right now. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there might have been some mistakes made in the past, but by and large, the community of first responders is there to help their community. And um, I think they really do deserve the community support for that. Good. I guess as a community, it's uh, you guys have, you guys have opinions about everything. I'm sure you got one. Of those <laughs> yeah, ones. yeah. Uh, for me, it's kind of it's, it's funny you ask that question because um, I've had a, a lot of time to think about it, and I've had friends call me about what I think about it, and uh, uh, just because I mean, just to kind of set the stage, it's because I'm African American and I've been a cop, so my brothers will call me and say, hey, "What do you think?" You know, one of my older brothers. Uh, He's uh, lives in Arlington, big into politics, and he's just one of those guys that I'm not going to get an opinion until I get it from you. That's what I do, and I'll take my notes and I'll look at both, and I really appreciate that yeah. with him. And I had about an hour of conversation with him, and I boiled it down to a few things. And I said, number one, like I've worked, like like you said, Colin, in both the police departments, and I've never had somebody that I worked with that treat me any differently or saw them treat some, some person of different color a uh, different way right. at all, not once. Um, I felt comfortable. I got promoted, never felt like I was shortchanged with that at all either. Um, but with that, with that aspect, I think what people tend to believe uh, and see with the eye and how the world will push it is that um, we're profiling one typical race, one, uh, one person, um, and these things are bad or happening um, in that area. But I, I like to put, there's a, there's a few things. So one, I think, um, Better training for law enforcement would help, you know, again, just to, to allow them to respond um, in a way that could help, you know, eliminate some kind of fire if they don't need to. And again, I'm not saying that they're, the reason why they do it is because they want to right. hurt somebody that's in the wrong race. But sometimes that somebody's never been in a situation like that and they won't respond how their bodies can respond. And we can sit back and watch it on a video and Oh no, I'm a cop been here for six years. I wouldn't done that way. You should have held containment with that person and then see where it goes. But if you've never been through that situation, you can't. So more training with law enforcement would definitely help in that area. And then two, allowing citizens to see and put them in scenarios to see how, how they would respond um, in a situation like that. Uh, and also to this is another big one for me that I, I tell a lot of guys. It starts with a lot of grace. If you you look at the word grace and what that means um, and I now that I teach law enforcement guys at straight out of college and they're all different backgrounds some that have never been in the US the day of their life or they just got their citizenship and they want to work in the Department of State and I let them I see let them paint the picture of what the Constitution is about why we have the Constitution um, and what it means to actually have to go through a due process yeah, because I've been on the side, I've been in court, and I think that's if citizens can understand the court process, there's a lot of things that can go right. Because a lot of what they're what they're mad about now is that it's injustice. This cop is not being held accountable yeah. for his actions. He's going to do this thing and goes to court, and guess what happens? He gets pled not guilty, and then the family's left with the with the with the pain, yeah. and they walk scot free, right? So in law enforcement, in every code section, and they know, right? There's things you got to do. 
and you may get an arrest because all you need is probable cause for that arrest. Then you go to court, and there's a judge decide whether you're guilty or not guilty off of what you wrote and off your off your probable cause. Yeah. Um, that's you get the prosecutor and defense attorney. The defense attorney's job is to defend the defendant and ensure that he's getting a fair <coughs> trial. So, in my beginning of my, my law enforcement career, I used to like, man, I can't stand lawyers. All I want to do is protect somebody who did something bad, right? Yeah. Until I made a mistake on something in Virginia, if you don't give them a play analysis form, you, they're not guilty of marijuana, possession of marijuana. I don't care if you found a pound. Yeah. If you do not give them a plan analysis form to have it actually tested in the lab, um, then it's not guilty. So the question is, are they guilty or are they not guilty? To a citizen, to us, yeah, you can't have marijuana. But due to the law and constitution, the individual is not guilty. So, and I've been on the side where a person that has committed a heinous crime, um, their family's back there and they're waiting and hoping that the judge would say not guilty so that that person can come. Right. And then you see the other person, the victims, like, man, I can't believe they got off. And then I've been on the other side where yeah. the person is found guilty and the family is hugging, um, letting it by. So I think the main thing is that there is grace. We all can look at our life and see nobody can answer the question that never committed a misdemeanor in their life. It's whether you got caught or you didn't get caught. <laughs> right. But what's fair, right? So the yeah. fact that you didn't get caught and this person did get caught, you're not bad an eye. But it's a matter of now you hope that because they're found out guilty, there's that little thing that was there that didn't hit the right line right. for the judge to say it's guilty. Right. And say, well, I hope that person learns from that mistake and they can move on and make better choices. Yeah. So we are all guilty of so many different things. It's whether we are in a position uh, to be sent to jail or not jail, right? So if we look at that and understand how that works, is that some people do get grace for yeah. the crimes they committed because something was missing. Well, and, and grace extends both directions. I Absolutely. Think. And it needs to extend to those who are out on the front line making the yeah. second decisions trying to figure it out. Absolutely. So I think that's the major key. So it's, it's just grace. Life, life's not fair. Right. If it was fair, we would all not have a hope in going to heaven. Well, and grace, I think, allows us to see things uh, separate from malicious intent. Absolutely. There are bad things that happen all the time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the person who did the thing intended for something bad to happen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's I where agree. grace comes in, too. Yeah. What else? What would you like the community to know? I would like them to know to quit getting there so-called facts off of memes on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Go educate yourself. Right. Because when we have a tragedy that happens in America, first thing somebody does is some basement kid makes a meme about it, and the next thing you know, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Some basement kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call it what it is. Somebody who doesn't really have a real life. Right. Yeah. They'll, they'll, make a, they'll make a meme about it, and then all of a sudden now that's the truth. That's, that's the reality. The truth. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody takes the time to educate themselves and find out what really happened. It's just they get this quick flash of somebody did this and this is the truth. And now that becomes the truth. And yeah. it's not really what happened. So there, There's a reason investigations sometimes take weeks or months yeah. Yeah. because there's a lot to consider. Mm -hmm. And we, watching a clip right. on the news, are making decisions about guilt or innocence. Yeah. I just want to add something on that. It's kind of like a good point, and Jeremy added it too where the intent of somebody is not like that. I remember my brother, when it was first going on, uh, a while back, I think it was like the first major incident that happened, and uh, he's like, man, what's going on? Why aren't you teaching these guys not to do stuff like that and hurt these guys and profile black African-Americans? And I remember telling him, like, I said, I said, uh, what if, let's, let's switch the role. What if it was me that was on TV? They just shot somebody, right? And they're exploding and saying I did something wrong. What would your mindset be? He said, well, I know you. So I know you wouldn't right, do that. I right. said, well, guess what? I don't know that guy, neither do you. I said, so because you don't have a personal relationship with you, you automatically just believe what everybody's putting online, what that could not be his intent. Right. You know, in, in this job, we know what people suffer when they have to take somebody's life. They do not like doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think if the community should know that. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, educate yourself and figure out what's actually yeah. going on. I mean, people are losing their businesses, losing their jobs, and losing their lives because Something happens, somebody posts a quick clip on Facebook, the whole world riots, we're burning down buildings and houses, and then inevitably, nine times out of ten, in six weeks, we find out that it really wasn't the way that it first popped out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now you've burnt down half your city, 
um, people have lost their lives in these riots. And over more times than not, a just shoot. It, it was. It ends up being legit. It ends up being a true situation. There was a weapon. There. This guy did this, or they did that. It ended up being illegal. And then when they find out that it was legal, we write again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it, right. it was the way it was supposed to happen. Right. There is rule of law, and there's mm -hmm. a reason that it's in place. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's to keep peace and order. Yeah. Well, I think to piggyback off Dustin there that. We need to realize that we call it law enforcement for a reason, mm -hmm. right? We're there to enforce the law. Not every outcome is going to be a positive outcome. Right. And I know that a lot of patrol cars ride around the streets and it says protect and serve, right? And there is a level of professionalism that we do expect from our law enforcement community. But what the people need to understand is that we're there to enforce the law. And I know from experience that every agency around that doesn't want to deal with something, they tack it on to law enforcement, yeah. right? From neighbor disper uh, disputes to mental health, right? Law enforcement now has to be deal with all mental health all of a sudden, right? We've been doing it for years. And we need to remember that. Mm. Yeah. We're here to enforce the law. Right. We're here to keep the peace. And and sometimes somebody's got to go to jail. And unfortunately, with the way that civilians have been acting lately and thinking that they have they can act any way they want without repercussion, there's still law in this land. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are men and women out there that are there to keep the peace, to protect the weak. Yeah. I mean, we took an oath of office, right? And a lot of times that ends with the death of a law enforcement officer. Mm. So I think the people need to realize that we're there to enforce the law. Yeah. And in the course of doing your job, you know, often dealing with bad people, mm -hmm. things yeah. happen. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't make it good or bad. It just, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fact. Well, I spend, you know, I always tell people, you're going to spend 95% of your pro your time with 5% of the population. Absolutely. When, I, true. when I worked night crew and I went to day crew yeah. and all of a sudden I was dealing with, you know, business owners and stuff and people were nice to me and want to give me hugs. <laughs> hey, me buy your lunch yeah. or a coffee. I was like, really? Yeah. That's cool because over there they were trying to shoot me yesterday. Yeah. Right? And it's all just switch from day crew to night crew or night yeah. crew to day crew, whatever it is. Yeah. But how... Uh, how does the lack of community support, and, and by the way, I think most communities support their first responders. Yeah. Um, I know certainly the community I live in does, and I think probably most, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what we're seeing is that that's not the case. What does a lack of community support do to you know, the man or woman on the street? Um, does that impact the police officers, the firefighters, the people who are out there you know, doing the work? 100%. Yeah. You know, if you're not appreciated in any job you do, if you're not appreciated, you don't want to do your job. And your performance level drops and your efficiency drops. Um, so the lack of support from the community, it, it's going to make me not want to hurry as much. It's not going to, it's going to make me not want to because what's, what's the reward? You know, police and fire and EMS, we don't, they definitely don't make a lot of money compared to other careers for the stuff that they have to put up with. Right. But we thrive off that pat on the back. We thrive off that good job, guys, way to go. We thrive on that. And that's, that's kind of our bonus, if you will. And when the community, and you're not getting that, you're just like, man, why am I doing this? You're back to just earning a paycheck. And when it becomes a job instead of a passion, yeah. the community ends up suffering from it. Yeah. Because yeah. few people get into this line of work just mm -hmm. to draw a paycheck. I never got into money, that's for sure. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things. I think you, there's a couple of things you're going to get a decrease in officers and people wanting to be cops. Right. Right, that's one. And then you're going to get people that are actually leaving police departments, which everybody that's worked in the police department know that manpower is always an issue. And that's why we never get home is because there's not enough men on the road. So therefore, now you have people, I know in just the city I live in, they've already lost four cops that have been there for 12, 13 years. And I have buddies that are walking off 
So now I can't do it anymore. It's 13 years, right? So those are two things, right? Manpower is going to be decreased. Not enough people going want to be police officers, so that's going to go away, which again builds more crime, which means your family's not going to be safe. Yep. Um, and then also, it takes it to the point of where um, you have um, individuals that uh, now are seeking that help. They can't get it. Um, and I, I think that's one of the major problems that's going to happen. And cops that are working still are going to be very hesitant to do something right. because they're afraid if they do something, it's going to be really yep. cool to be thrown in jail. And guess what? Their family's going to have nothing and they're going to be sued, which means guess what's going to happen to them? Officers will lose their lives a lot faster because we know hesitation <laughs> kills. It's, you, it's, you kills. And you can't do that in this job. Yeah. Um, so I think that's so, the most important. Okay, so in this climate, um, and maybe Colin, you can start this one off. In this climate, and we've had this discussion in the last couple of days with some of the students that are here, men, men and women, men who are here this week, are looking out saying, I just don't want to do this job anymore. You just mentioned that. I want to walk away from this. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Um, but, you know, my personal belief is we need strong people of character mm -hmm. um, in positions like law enforcement, uh, you know, those men and women who are willing to run into burning buildings and pull little kids out and do the work that you guys do. We need strong people of character to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are the people, the strong people of character that would leave during a time like this. Um, what are you saying to these guys this week who are saying, I might just quit this thing, I can't do it anymore. Or friends that you know, people that you work with that are just, you know, it's not worth it. The money's not as good as I can get somewhere else. The appreciation from the, from the communities out there. Um, how do you encourage you know, the folks that you know? Um, <clears throat> I, I would say it's a noble profession, right? Uh, military had to deal with it back in the 60s, coming back from Vietnam. Uh, it's a noble profession, what you're doing, protecting your community, and that somebody still needs to stay in that watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it may not always be the most popular thing to do, um, mm -hmm. but somebody has to, to pick up the slack and do the hard work that no one else is willing to do and get in there and get dirty doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it may, you may not be viewed what, very well by your peers and by your, your family members and your friends, but it's a job that is definitely needed and I don't see too many people standing in right. line to do it right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what do you say to these guys? I would say, who do you want to protect your family? Mm. That's a great question. Mm. Right? Who do you want to protect your family? Yeah. What the community needs to remember is that law enforcement, first responders, firemen, we are part of the community. We came from the community, right? And it is a noble profession. I agree 100% with you. Sometimes we do got to, we got to get down and dirty. But who do you want to stand watch? If it's not us, then who? Yeah. You, we don't want, we don't want people with no character. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because then we, I mean, we've seen other agencies where that happens. I mean, we, we repeat history. This has happened before. Right. Yeah, it sure has. So, I mean, the community needs to remember that we are part of the community. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are you talking about? You can talk to everybody. <laughs> Texas you, you're connected to more people than I think any other person I know. <laughs> I think uh, my boss would agree with you. That. <laughs> she, uh, she says all the time, well, if, I bet Dusty can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or sarcasm. I don't know. Um, I try to tell them, uh, a lot like what Saul says, is um, who's going to do it if you don't? Yeah. Um, and yes, you're already stressed, you're already strained out, you're already, you're already um, hurting, but you've proven that you can work under that pressure. Mm -hmm. So the next guy may not be able to do that. So if you don't want to do it anymore, who's going to do it? And I think Saul, Saul gave the best answer, the answer that I like to give as well is, is it takes a special person to do this, right. and you're already proven that you can do it. Why? Yeah. Why would you want to back out on it? Yeah. And to the agencies, I would say, why are you letting these guys go? Right? If they're proven operators, 
Why are you letting them go? Why not take the time and spend a little money to heal them? You've already, especially in California, you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to train them, hmm. right? Why are you letting them go? Let's get them healed, right? You trained, you spent so much money training the outside to do a certain job. Yeah. Why aren't we taking care of the inside? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they fold under political pressure a little too easy. I would like to see a chief somewhere stand up and go, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think more and more we're seeing some of that. It's, it's been encouraging, particularly, uh, you know, in the county, county sheriff's departments, and we've seen mm -hmm. some sheriffs who they're elected, so it's a different situation, right? right. 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 And a lot of them are, are really right now standing up and yeah. saying, yeah, no, I'm going to take care of my people. Mm -hmm. But we just need more of that. That needs to be the standard. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, guys, I really appreciate it. We can talk all day, but you got work to do. So, <laughs> right. yes, sir. I don't want to keep you here all day. But thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for what you've done. And, and we'll just uh, keep plugging away here. Right. And appreciate, appreciate it. it. For those of you that are watching, thank you so much for watching. Um, we live in a crazy world, but it is is always an encouragement to me to know uh, that we have men and women who are standing on the front line. We're doing the work because it is a noble work, because it needs to be done, because they're people of character. And we need to support them. And, you know, why that's not a popular position right now is beyond me. <laughs> um, but certainly, organizationally, you know, the Mighty Oaks Foundation, we do everything that we can to support our men and women who are serving us in our communities every day. And you need to find ways to do that as well. And I trust that you will. Thank you for watching. We will talk to you next time.